Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, in this series, what we're doing, of course, is we are looking at one of the most important doctrines as Seventh-day Adventists. Ellen White identifies it as one of the pillars of our faith. You see here that she sees in, uh, you see it in the orange, pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ. So those are all some of the pillars of our faith, and we're just going to be focusing on the one the personality of God. Actually, we're going to touch a little bit on the personality of Christ in this video too. So um, we'll just stay tuned for that. Now uh, here, she not only you know identifies the personality of God as one of our pillars, but further on in the same manuscript, she says, when men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation, so this is part of our foundation, from the foundation which God has established by his Holy Spirit, let the aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly. And of course, as I pointed out before, this statement was made in 1905. And from 1905, who were the pioneers in the work from that perspective? So that goes all the way back to the very beginning, as we'll see here in just a moment. But some of the pioneers were still alive. A.C. Bordeaux was one of those who was still alive when this statement was made. But then she also says, and let those who are dead speak also by reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. So this is why we're including the pioneers' writings on this pillar doctrine known as the personality of God, because Ellen White identifies it, first of all, as one of our pillar doctrines and uh, identifies it as part of our foundation and recommends that we should reprint the articles written by the pioneers on these topics if men come in who would move a pin or pillar from the foundation. Now, why did she make this statement in the first place? Well, at the time, uh, prominent SDAs were actually moving some pins or pillars from our foundation, and she had to correct them on that. And so um, here's a letter written in 1903, where she tells the recipient uh, that they're not definitely clear on the personality of God. And notice that she identifies it as something that is everything to us as a people. Obviously, that's really important. That's why we're taking the time to look at this and to do so so very thoroughly and so very carefully because this is the eighth video so far and there's a lot more to come. This is the eighth video in this series. Now, you don't need to have watched the other videos first in order to follow this. Not at all. That's why I, I cover this um these few slides at the beginning of every presentation, because I want to make sure that every video can stand on its own, that you don't have to go back and see all those other videos first. Although I do recommend that you look at uh, as many of them as you can, right? Because there's just so much to this topic and I don't cover the same thing in every video. Uh, looking at different pioneers in every video and um, some different statements from Ellen White in every video. Now, some of the statements from Ellen White overlap, but not all of them. And anyway, we're going to see some new statements even today from Ellen White that I have never mentioned uh, prior to this in any of the other videos. So anyway, back to this slide. Further on in this letter, she says, we cannot for a moment have any misrepresentation upon these solemn and important subjects of truth. Now, notice this which have been the faith of our people since 1844. This means much to us. So notice she's pointing back. Now, we saw in the manuscript from 1905 that she refers to the personality of God as one of the pillars of our faith, a foundation that was established by God. So it's not even just something that was like, well, we believed this early on, but, you know, maybe we need to change some details about it. No, she identified it as a foundational truth that wasn't established by the minds of men. It was established by God, by his Holy Spirit. Now, these are so important, something that's everything to us as a people. It requires some diligent 
study, some detailed investigations into the topic of what is this pillar doctrine known as the personality of God, okay? So that's why we're looking at articles by the pioneers that include explanations of what it means for God to be a person. So what we're doing is we're looking at, you know, key articles that contain the topic of the personality of God to find out how did early SDAs use the word person and its variants like personality, personage, impersonal, personally, and all that. We're examining it in connection with how they described, you know, God, Christ, angels, whatever. And we want to find out what did they mean by saying things like God is a person. Seems like a really simple statement, but people are very confused on this. They don't know what it means for God to be a person and what it means for God to have a person because they made statements like God has a person. Now, in this video in particular, we're going to see statements regarding angels being persons because uh, they wrote a lot about that too, the personality of the angels. Angels are persons. They said God is a personal being, and that's another statement that we're going to be examining pretty closely in this particular video. And also, A.C. Bordeaux mentions that personally, God is in heaven. We're going to find out, well, what does he really mean by that? And uh, so this is the article that we're looking at from A.C. Bordeaux. It's found in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, and it's titled The Hope That Is In You. OK, now A.C. Bordeaux, just a very short bio on him, not really even a bio, just a little bit, just a little introduction to A.C. Bordeaux. He became an SDA in 1856 and um, he held, you know, positions like uh, president of the Quebec Conference in Canada because he was a French Canadian. OK, so in 1880, he became the president of the Quebec Conference. And in the mid 1880s, when Ellen White traveled to Europe and was preaching there and all that, he and his brother Daniel traveled with her and worked with her as her translators. So, um, yeah, he worked very closely with Ellen White in the 1880s. So, you know, he was a pretty prominent SDA. He was definitely in leadership positions. And so he um, needed to know what the pillars of our faith were. And this is one such article where he explains it. And it's really quite an incredible article. It's kind of long. We're not going to cover the whole thing. It's way too long to do that. As you see there, there's three full pages in the Review and Herald that, um, you know, it, it takes up. So that's too much to cover in one video, but I recommend that you read it. And I'm going to have a link to it in the description. I'll also have a link or two to some things from Ellen White that um, it would be, I think you would find it very, very, um, not just interesting, but like really helpful and informative to compare some of the things that Ellen White wrote that are like on this, this very same theme that A.C. Bordeaux was writing on. Because the title, The Hope That Is In You, it's really focusing. Um, very broadly, like to the the whole Christian hope, like what do we have to look forward to? Because um, there's a lot of confusion about that too. So it covers some of the topics related to the state of the dead, and you know what happens when you die. Do you what what do the scriptures say about what happens when you die? And so he really does a pretty thorough job with that, and yet super concise. Like it's it covers such a lot in a relatively small area. Um, so it's a really uh, incredible article, especially when you connect it to some of the things that Ellen White wrote and explained, because obviously her writings are awesome. Um, I, you know, there's, it's hard to compare anything to the way Ellen White wrote under divine inspiration. So but she did recommend that we reprint the articles by the pioneers on these pillar doctrines. And so clearly she believed that they understood the truth about these pillar doctrines. And the more um, things that we look at, the, the broader our scope of investigation into 
what was written about these pillar doctrines by the very early pioneers, it can help to round out our understanding and to make sure that we aren't just privately interpreting what Ellen White wrote. You know what I mean? Like the pioneers, there's there's a wide variety of different people represented um, in this series. And so we can see, well, what did they understand her to be teaching? Because she said that when she received divine revelation about these pillar doctrines, then she passed on the information to the pioneers and they received it. They accepted it as light direct from heaven. And they all united and started teaching this um, harmonious doctrine uh, on, well, like I said, we're just focusing on the personality of God. But anyway, she says the whole body of uh, the whole company of believers came into unity on these points of faith and doctrine. And uh, she told him what position they were to take concerning truth and duty. I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head some of the ways that she framed that. But anyway, I cover some of those other statements about how the pillars were established. I cover those in some of the very early episodes, like episodes one and two in particular, I think. So let's get started now into the meat of this article. So the hope that is in you, and it's not starting from the very, very beginning, but as we'll see here, um, I'm going to share a few slides that kind of give a little bit more of the context so that it's not just totally out of the blue. But again, we're focusing on what did he mean about God being a person? Okay, he says, in showing what is the Christian's hope, we should present valid reasons based on scriptural arguments and evidences. Many are the hopes cherished by different classes, even among the religious sects of the day. But every hope to be well-grounded must be based on the promises of God. A thus saith the Lord is necessary on this point as well as on other points of truth. Now there can be many false hopes, but there can be but one true gospel hope. Paul says, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, Ephesians 4, 4. Though it may have many branches, or there may be several things to be accomplished in order to the bringing in of the object for which we are hoping, it is called one hope. Without having a disposition to dwell to any great length upon the false hopes cherished by many, I will here notice some of the popular sentiments which are received by the mass of professors of Christianity. In doing this, I shall call the attention of the friends to instructions that I, with others, received at a French Baptist Educational Institute in Canada several years ago. So what he's about to share is, you know, what he was um, in, instructed or, or taught specifically at a Baptist educational institute, but his point here is that this isn't representative of just whatever Baptists believe. He's just saying that these are popular sentiments which are received by the majority of Christians. And um, just as part of this, he's going to relate something that he was taught at a particular institute. And of course, like I said, he's French Canadian, so he was attending a Canadian institute. Okay, so he says, while taking Bible lessons, we were taught by Professor Rue, number one, that God is an infinite and eternal spirit without person, body, shape, or parts, is everywhere and nowhere present, or is everywhere as a spirit and nowhere as a tangible being. I ask, is not this making God almost a mere nothing? Okay, now we need to unpack that a little bit. We need to understand what we're reading here. So let's examine it. Let's consider this. And there's a lot more to follow, but we'll just start with this first slide. So notice he says that he was taught that God is an infinite and eternal spirit without person, you know, body, shape, or parts. And then he was also taught about God, that God is everywhere and nowhere present, but then he's going to explain what that is supposed to mean. So the idea is that he's everywhere as a spirit and nowhere as a tangible being, right? So everywhere as a spirit and nowhere as a tangible being. So that's what he means by 
he was taught that God is everywhere and nowhere present. But then notice he asks, is not this making God almost a mere nothing? Now we're going to be seeing much more about this idea of making someone or, or God in particular, but not just God, it's really applied to many things, a mere nothing or like they don't exist. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it yet because there's just, there's a lot to cover, but we will also see some of what Ellen White has to say on this particular topic. But, um, for now, let's just kind of make a mental note. Okay, so far, you know, this is the first instance of the word person being used by AC Bordeaux in this article. And we see that he's saying that he was taught that God is without person, without body shape or parts. So we're starting to get an idea of what he means by person. And also the description about where God is or where God isn't or how he's present or how he isn't present is there. And then we clearly see that his view of this is that it makes God, you know, almost a mere nothing, right? So now let's continue. And you'll notice that it says point four now. I'm just skipping points two and three because there's a lot to cover and they don't include the word person um, to really help us to understand you know, his usage of the word. So even though it's all super important, very relevant to just understanding uh, what the Christian's hope is in general, it it's not going to be um, something that we're going to look at in this video. But please check out the link and please read the whole article. Okay. So the other thing, one of the other things that he was taught at this um, institute was that the angels and the saved in heaven before and after the resurrection are spirits having no person, form, nor parts. Their nature is such that nothing can obstruct their way. They can with ease pass through the most dense and the solidest wall in existence. And then you know, I'm skipping a little bit for sake of time, but then he says, it is wonderful how such beings, question mark, can exist. Now, just to be clear, when he says wonderful, just keep in mind, this is, you know, like well over 150 years ago, maybe 170. I, I didn't do the math, but um, ahead of time to, to really remember. But, you know, this was, I think, published in 18, yeah, 1869. So it was a long time ago and the word wonderful there, you know, language changes how we use it over time. And um, where today we would say the word something is wonderful, typically to convey the meaning that it's spectacular, you know, or something really good, some really great quality about it. Oh man, that was wonderful. If you want to give, you know, your kid a... Um, some positive feedback for how they did on their exam or whatever. Oh, that was wonderful. You did a wonderful job or, you know, how well they helped around the house. Okay. But what this really means is that it's full of wonder. Now, when you wonder something, I wonder what I'm going to do tomorrow. You're asking, you're questioning, you don't know. Like, that's what it means to be wonderful in this context. It is wonderful. It's full of wonder, like questioning how such beings can exist. And we know that by the context, you know, where he has that question mark in parentheses, when you'll see this in early SDA writings, um, fairly often when they're conveying um, ideas that they did not agree with, but they're still trying to convey really they're trying to represent what the view is, even though they don't agree with the view. A lot of times they'll put a question mark in parentheses to show like, okay, even though I'm using this word here, eh, I really don't believe that it's applicable. Like this isn't really something I'm on board with. So the idea that angels and the saved in heaven before and after the re resurrection are spirits having no person, form, nor parts, that's again more um, explanation as to how he's using the word 
person in this context. And of course, the rest of this is very informative, uh, describing how he was taught that the nature of angels and the saved in heaven before and after the resurrection is such that, you know, they can just pass through the densest of materials. The, the most solid wall you can think of, you know, they can just pass right through. And he's like, it's really wonderful how such beings can exist. Okay. So then he goes on, he says, let us add to this the testimony of Luther Lee. Now, Luther Lee was just um, a contemporary Methodist minister. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I'm pretty sure he was a Methodist minister, but just one of the other denominations, not an SDA. And here's what Luther Lee says about the so-called immortal soul. Okay. He says, let us add to this the testimony of Luther Lee. He describes the immortal soul as follows. So now this is quoting Luther Lee's description of the immortal soul. It is a simple spiritual essence, immortal, immaterial, intangible, indissoluble, having no exterior or interior surface, cannot be extended. It is analogous to God, cannot come in contact with matter, and does not occupy space. And we might add, does not weigh anything. So that's the end of the quote from Luther Lee. Now, A.C. Bordeaux says, could anyone do any better in trying to define nothing than to give it this description? Okay, now let's consider this for a moment because this is really important. He's asking, could anyone do any better in trying to define nothing than to give it this description? And what again is the description? That's the description, that bigger highlighted uh, section, the, high, the yellow highlights. Okay. Now, he's saying here that this description, this definition could be exactly how you would define nothing. So if you wanted to try to give a definition for what constitutes nothing, he's saying, could anyone do any better than to give it this description? Now, we've got a whole lot still to look at from Ellen White, you know, in, in relation to this, but I want you to pay, uh, we're not going to cover every detail of the description um, that he gave here, well, that he's quoting from Luther Lee, but there's just some parts about the description that I'd like to bring to your attention. Okay, so Luther Lee is saying that this description, he, you know, like in the midst of that, he says that the immortal soul is analogous to God. So in other words, it's comparable to God. The immortal soul has a resemblance to, you know, to God himself or whatever God is, right? That's how you would describe God. You could use these same terms to describe God as you would use, according to Luther Lee, to describe the immortal soul. And notice that one of the expressions used in the description is that God is a spiritual essence. Okay. Now, along with the rest of this, you know, um, well, actually, I said that a little bit wrong. He's saying that the immortal soul is a spiritual essence, but he's saying that that's analogous to God. So really, people do describe God as a spiritual essence. Okay, that's a very common um, way of describing God's personhood. Now, if you look at this whole description, and you can consider um, what's lacking in all of these terms. And that is that it's all lacking any kind of body, right? Uh, if it's immaterial, immaterial means not material. So there's no material properties at all. Um, intangible means that it's not tangible. Okay, so there's no way of touching it. Um, indissoluble means it can't be separated. 
So there's no parts to that. Um, immortal, we're familiar with the term immortal. I kind of skipped that. Um, you know, having no exterior or interior surface. Well, if something is nothing, obviously it would have an exterior or interior surface. If there's nothing there at all, there's no surface. Okay. And uh, doesn't come in contact with matter because obviously if there's no matter there, there's nothing to come into contact with matter. Okay. And does not occupy space because if there's no body, if, if there's no structure, no form, no body, then where is it? It, it, it isn't anywhere. So it doesn't occupy space. And of course, if there's no matter there, then it has uh, no mass and it doesn't weigh anything, right? So you can see how that description, if you wanted to try to define nothing, that's where they logically lead. All right. Now we are going to come back to this a little bit because um, Ellen White has some things to say about this as well. But first, let's continue just a little bit further with A.C. Bordeaux's article. This is the fifth point that he was taught that, or that he's listing anyway, that he was taught at the um, French Baptist Institute. That heaven is a spirit world inhabited by spiritual beings, hence is not a tangible place, yet is filled with bliss and joy unspeakable, etc. To this, add the words of the poet, beyond the bounds of time and space, reach forward to that heavenly place, the saints secure abode. Okay, now let's just look at this again. Okay, so he said that heaven is a spirit world, world. He was taught that inhabited by spiritual beings, hence is not a tangible place. So in other words, it's this spirit world inhabited by spiritual beings, and therefore it's not tangible because they're not tangible. They're all intangible. That's, you know, the idea. And of course, um, this description also beyond the bounds of time and space. Uh, he just saw from Luther Lee's description that the uh, immortal soul that's analogous to God also doesn't occupy any space. So these are the types of things that he was taught at that institute. Now, after all that, he says, is this not spiritualizing away God, angels, saints, and heaven, burning them down to nothing, as it were, by the fire of spiritualism? Okay, well, notice there, this spiritualizing away that he says is like a good description of nothing, um, he calls it spiritualism. And spiritualism literally just means like the ISM suffix there means belief, belief in, right? So you could break the word down to mean belief in the spiritual, which in this context is meaning belief in the non-physical, the immaterial, the indissoluble, et cetera, et cetera. So he said, is this not spiritualizing away God, angels, saints, and heaven, burning them down to nothing by the fire of spiritualism? Again, spiritualism clearly was understood by the early SDAs to be more broad than just the idea that the dead are conscious, right? So that's one thing we can take away from this. But anyway, so here's a little recap so far of what he just described that he says, hey, isn't all of this spiritualizing God and angels, saints in heaven away? And he calls it spiritualism. So he said that he was taught that God and angels and all that are without person body, shape, or form, okay, being everywhere as an intangible spiritual essence. And I'm just summarizing this for sake of time and space, but that is one of the things he covered that he says, isn't this spiritualizing away, you know, all this stuff, being nowhere as a tangible being, okay, so everywhere as an intangible spiritual essence, but nowhere as a tangible being, isn't the spiritualizing God all away? 
being beyond the bounds of time and space? Isn't this spiritualizing away God, angels, saints, and heaven, burning them down to nothing, as it were, by the fire of spiritualism? Okay, so that's so far what we've seen from ac bordeaux's article and we're going to come back to cover more from that but first we want to take a look at some of what ellen white had to say in particular in regard to whether or not god is an essence okay so she starts off by saying the theory that he and from the context of the letter it's very clear that she's referring to god OK, so she says the theory that God is an essence pervading everything is one of Satan's most subtle devices. I warn you to beware of being led to accept theories leading to any such view. I tell you, my brother, that the most spiritual minded Christians are liable to be deceived by these beautiful, seducing, flattering theories. But in the place of honoring God, these theories in the minds of those who receive them bring him down to a low level where he is nothingness okay now by this point this language in this quote should sound super familiar we just saw this type of stuff in what ac bordeaux was sharing that uh, like he was taught in the baptist institute and things that luther lee the methodist minister uh, taught about God, about, well, about um, the immortal soul and how it's analogous to God and that it's a simple spiritual essence and it's, you know, immortal, immaterial, intangible, indissoluble, et cetera, et cetera. And just notice that she's saying here that those theories about God being an essence or theories that lead to any such view, they're Satan's most subtle devices. Now that should make us want to be super careful, like to be very on guard to question our beliefs about God's personality and to really get to the point of knowing, are we on the foundation that God established by divine revelation when this movement was formed? And if there's anything that followed to its logical conclusion would lead to the view of God being an essence, wow, let's break free of that as soon as possible. And it's important to um, be willing to just really question and consider our views and compare them with the foundation that was established by God at the early days of the movement, because she's saying, she's warning this person, like, I warn you that the most spiritual minded Christians are liable to be deceived by these theories. And she describes them as being perceived by people as beautiful, seducing and flattering theories. So it's not like they're just, you know, openly teaching things that people would automatically be able to recognize as Satan's um, ideas. You know, a lot of people can be deceived thinking that these are actually honoring to God to view him this way. But Ellen White says in the place of honoring God, these theories bring him to a low level where he's nothingness. Now we saw what um, A.C. Bordeaux was saying about the views, uh, the popular views in Christianity about God being without body parts, immaterial, intangible, um, you know, everywhere as an intangible spirit, nowhere as a tangible being, uh, beyond the bounds of time and space, and that these descriptions, you couldn't do any better to try to describe nothing than to give it this description, right? So we're seeing the same sorts of things being said by Ellen White in this statement. But she didn't all only teach that God is not an essence. She explicitly said that God is not intangible. In fact, she says Jesus taught that God was not intangible. Jesus taught that God was a rewarder of the righteous and a punisher of the transgressor. He was not an intangible spirit, but a living ruler of the universe. Now, Ellen White also says that 
we're not to hold spiritualistic ideas. She uses this terminology in describing God's personhood or what it means for God to be a person. This is a, um, a statement that's pointing back to the fact that she had seen in vision many times that Jesus is a person. And, and in February of 1845 is when she had her first vision about God's personhood, the father's personhood. And she asked Jesus in her vision in February, 1845, if his father was a person and had a form like himself. Now, first of all, of course, that's showing us that when Ellen White was asking if God the Father was a person, had a form, that that's what she meant by person, you know, that in includes having a form, like Jesus, in fact. And Jesus didn't tell her, oh, that's off limits. You shouldn't ask me about that. And he just, you know, answers her uh, here. She says, Jesus told her, I am in the express image of my father's person. So in other words, he's confirming that, yes, my father has a form like me. I'm the express image of my father's person. Then notice what Ellen White says. I have often seen that the spiritual view took away the glory of heaven and that in many minds, the throne of David and the lovely person of Jesus had been burned up in the fire of spiritualism. So here she's saying, like, look, the father is a person. These spiritual views that she equates with spiritualism aren't true representations of Jesus or his father. And like in contrast with saying that he's without form, she's repeatedly trying to get across the idea that you know, he's a personal being. And notice here that this is a variation of the word person, right? Personal being, he's a person. Now let's take at some, uh, let's take a look at a statement that she makes about this. She says, through Jesus Christ, God, not a perfume, so not an essence, not a perfume, not something intangible, but a personal God. Now let's just stop there for a second and, com and consider that. She's contrasting. On the one hand, we've got the idea that God is not a perfume, not something intangible. So what is he? He's a personal God. The contrast there is, is between things that don't have body, shape, or form with a personal God. In other words, the, the contrast there shows that she's using the phrase a personal God to indicate a God with a form, with a body, something tangible. But then notice what else she says in this statement. So through Jesus Christ, God created man and endowed him with intelligence and power. So together, God, God's not a perfume, not something intangible. God's a personal God and God created through Jesus Christ, God created man and endowed him with intelligence and power. So she's connecting statements about God's being, God's personhood, God's a personal being, not something intangible with the creation account of Adam and Eve, right? So now let's take a look at a few additional statements that make that connection more full. It'll become very obvious. In this statement, she says, God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being for man was made in his image. Okay. So in considering that statement, we can see a few things. She's saying, sure, God is a spirit, but then She's saying, you know, yet, as in other words, even still, he is a personal being. Okay, so we just saw that she said God is not something intangible and he's not a perfume. He's a personal being. He's a personal God. Here, God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being. And then the reason we can know that he's a personal being for indicates that she's about to give a reason, right? for or because for man was made in his image. So what is it about man being made in the image of God that explains that even though he's a spirit, he's a 
personal being. Well, this gives us a clue. Uh, the great controversy, she says, in the beginning, man was created in the likeness of God, not only in character, but in form and feature. Okay. Now, elsewhere, she also says, created to be the image and glory of God, Adam and Eve had received endowments not unworthy of their high destiny. Graceful and symmetrical in form, regular and beautiful in feature, their countenances, okay, like, you know, their face, their countenances, glowing with the tint of health and the light of joy and hope, they bore in outward resemblance the likeness of their maker. Now, when we compare these statements about the creation of man and the emphasis on their physical form, their shape, their outward features, their outward resemblance to their maker, it's obvious that Ellen White believed and taught that God has a form. He has physical features. And since humans have an outward resemblance to God's likeness, we know what his form looks like, right? This is what it means, according to Ellen White, to be made in God's image. And it explains why she says that God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being for man was made in his image. She's referring to the fact that God has a physical form. This is what it means for God to be a personal being. Okay, now let's return for a moment to this slide and this statement from A.C. Bordeaux, because uh, there's another aspect to what he said that it's going to be really important to um, bring in a connection with something that Ellen White also says that's very similar. Now notice Bordeaux's expression, spiritualizing away, okay? And we just saw, but I'll just briefly restate it. We just saw how he's explaining that um, portraying anything as um, immaterial, incorporeal, non-physical, etc., is equivalent to spiritualizing away. And he is applying that to anything, no matter what it is, uh, anything that portray is portrayed as immaterial is reducing it to nothingness, it's spiritualizing it away. Okay, now let's see if Ellen White shared the same usage of spiritualizing away. In this statement from The Great Controversy, she says, a fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. Okay, and it's referring to the new earth. Okay, so notice here, she says uh, the fear of the inheritance seeming too material leads people to spiritualize away. Now, this shows that she understood spiritualizing away to refer to portraying it as something immaterial. Because if it's too material, you have to make it not material. That is what she's saying is spiritualizing away. This expression, spiritualize away, has reference to what Ellen White often called the spiritual view. Um, we're going to look at that. It's viewing things as spiritual rather than material or non-physical rather than physical. This is a statement that she's making um, regarding some beliefs held about Jesus' second coming. And she says, many spiritualize this second coming all the way. But the very same Jesus that ascended up into heaven, the angel said he would come in like manner. Now, this has to do um, primarily with the well, I guess they, they do take slightly different forms, the various views of Jesus' spiritual return. But shortly after the great disappointment, you know, after the passing of the time in 1844, there were 
um, many Adventists who adopted the spiritual view of Christ's coming. She mentions this in uh, the book she and um, James White co-authored about their life sketches. And she says different errors were affecting the Adventist people. The spiritual view of Christ's coming, that great deception of Satan, was ensnaring many, and we were often obliged, through a sense of duty, to bear a strong testimony against it. Now, this is um, also something that she referred to, just like I said, as spiritualism, right? We've looked at this quote that's on the bottom half of the slide. This is just the last portion of the quote that we've seen already. You may remember it. She says, I have often seen that the spiritual view took away the glory of heaven and that in many minds, the throne of David and the lovely person of Jesus had been burned up in the fire of spiritualism. Now, it's noteworthy that the spiritual view is the same as spiritualism. And there's this spiritual view that um, many Adventists fell into believing that she refers to as a great deception. So what were the spiritual view or what was the spiritual view of Christ's coming that she's referring to? Now, this on the screen right now is something that was written by a person who believed the spiritual view of Christ's second coming. And this was written by Solomon Fenton. He held the spiritual view. He wrote this and published it in March, 1845. Now, notice what he says. Now, again, this is in the words of a person who held the spiritual view of Christ's second coming. And this is what he means by that. He says, now I am unable to find one single passage in the Bible to prove that Christ will ever come in the body that he went away with. The same Jesus is not confined to the body. So that phrase, the same Jesus or this same Jesus, you know, that's an allusion to the passage in Luke where the two angels appear to the disciples who are watching Jesus ascend in the, into the sky to go to heaven. And they're like, hey, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus will come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Okay. This, this person who um, held the spiritual view of Christ's return says, Jesus, this same Jesus isn't confined to the body. And he points to 2 Corinthians 3.17 as his, um, his reason for believing this, because 2 Corinthians says, now the Lord is that spirit. So he says, well, if the Lord is that spirit, then the coming must be spiritual. He also points to 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 1, verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. And then he adds, not in a separate body, but in them. So look at all these things that Solomon Fenton, who held the spiritual view, is saying. He's saying that Jesus isn't confined to a bodily existence. He's not confined to the body. He's a spirit. So his coming must be spiritual. And when he comes, he, he won't come in a separate body. He'll come in the bodies of his saints. That's the spiritual view of Christ's return that Ellen White was referring to. And the spiritual view, this immaterial view, this non-physical view of no matter what it is, takes away, um, just basically burns everything down to basically nothingness, right? Takes away the glory of heaven, um, in many minds, the throne of David and the lovely person of Jesus had been burned up in the fire of spiritualism. Spiritualizing away, spiritual view took away, being burned up by spiritualism, those are all basically equivalent statements or expressions to describe immaterialistic views, something that is in contrast to the material views, okay? Now, let's just pick back up now and try to finish with the portion of his article that we want to cover in this video. 
So it's a longer video than some of our others, but sometimes it's just hard to do justice to a topic without making it a bit longer. All right. Now he goes on to say, now many of the texts already quoted and alluded to show that these views are not in accordance with the teachings of the sacred word. Though, as we have seen, many professed ministers of the gospel preach them as truths. However, let us briefly examine these points in the light of scriptures. We are clearly shown. Okay, now we're about to get into what he's going to say about what the scriptures actually teach about the, the points that we've covered. So the first point, number one that God is a material organized intelligence possessing both body and parts. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. And then again, I'm skipping a little bit because of sake of time. He says, image here must mean physical form, and this scripture proves that God has a form. So rem remember that statement from Ella White where she says, God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being, for man was made in his image. That's what he's pointing to as the teachings of scripture. God is a material organized intelligence. That's what they're meaning by God is a personal being. He's a material, organized intelligence possessing body and parts. Okay. Image means physical form. God has a form. In Exodus 33, verses 20 to 23, we read that the Lord said to Moses, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand, while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Then Bordeaux says, thus Moses was permitted to see some parts of God's person. So he's pointing to the fact that the scriptures teach that God has parts, God has a body, right? Moses saw some parts of God's person. So that tells us that his meaning of person here is referring to God's body, God's form, God's shape. He goes on to say, in the Bible, God is represented as having eyes, ears, arms, hands, feet, etc. You know, all the sensible body parts that humans have and were made in God's image. He wrote his law with his own finger on two tables of stone. The Bible certainly represents God as located in heaven. Now remember, something that isn't material, doesn't take up any space, doesn't have any location, right? You have to have body to have location. If you don't have a location, you don't have a body, right? And that's just the same as nothing, okay? If you have no location, you're nowhere, right? That's how you would describe nothing. But the Bible certainly represents God as located somewhere. He's located in heaven. And then he quotes Psalm 102 as proof, for he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Christ taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, etc., Matthew 6, 9. Now, Bordeaux says, God is represented to be everywhere, number one, by virtue of his omniscience, so his knowledge about everything that's going on everywhere, right? So by virtue of his omniscience, and two, by virtue of his spirit, which is his representative, and is manifested wherever he pleases. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 10. But personally, God is in heaven. Okay, so the main point here is that personally, uh, God is in heaven. He's not personally everywhere. 
Okay. He's in heaven. The only ways in which he's represented to be everywhere is through his knowledge. He knows about everything that's going on everywhere. And um, by a representative being manifested wherever he pleases. So notice even there, it's not even saying that his representative is literally everywhere all at once, just says that he's manifested wherever he pleases, but God himself is in heaven. Then again, we're going to skip points two and three, like we did in the earlier section where he was going through the many false hopes and what he was taught on those points two and three. And then we're, we're just going to pick up now with point four, um, just to mirror what we covered earlier. So this is again, what he's saying is actually taught in the scriptures. He says that the scriptures teach that angels in heaven are literal persons possessing body and parts, as may be seen from the fact that they have been entertained and fed and have been seen by many. So these are all just pretty straightforward statements. Um, angels are literal persons too. They have bodies and parts. Then he goes on to say point number five, the scriptures teach that the righteous shall inherit substance. Then he references Proverbs 8 verses 20 and 21. He says, it is not a heaven beyond the bounds of time and space that they will inherit. Now notice the reason he gives for this would be no heaven, right? Because it spiritualizes away, burns it down to nothingness. It's the same as describing nothing to describe things as beyond the bounds of time and space or immaterial, intangible, indissoluble, et cetera, et cetera, right? He says, this would be no heaven. The scriptures teach that God sits on a literal throne in heaven and occupies space. I mean, this is a really uh, quite incredible article. He's so explicit. He really doesn't leave any room for uh, having to make an inference about what he means. He's super clear. So God occupies space. God is in heaven. Heaven is a place in space and time, like it's a real place. That's what he's saying. Some say that the texts that are here presented are figurative and are not to be taken in a literal sense. That is, we should not give them a literal meaning. Okay, now, before we even just continue to consider the rest of that, let's look at a slide from Ellen White referring to this point that Bordeaux just made that, um, you know, he says, many people are saying that you shouldn't just interpret these passages in the Bible literally. You should give them a figurative meaning, okay? Well, here's what Ellen has to say about taking the obvious, you know, plain literal meaning about passages in the scriptures. And she says, um, the truths most plainly revealed in the Bible have been involved in doubt and darkness by learned men who, with a pretense of great wisdom, teach that the scriptures have a mystical, a secret, spiritual meaning not apparent in the language employed. These men are false teachers. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. Now, I mean, you know, clearly, if someone's being um, referred to as a tree transplanted upon streams of waters, like you find in Psalm 1, well, that's obviously a symbol or a figure being employed to represent the man, right? It's not to be understood literally that the man is a tree for like, just literally a tree. Okay. So that's where a symbol or figure is employed for representing something else. But if you're just talking about the man and you're describing what he looks like and what body parts he has and where he is and what he's doing, you can just take that literally. And they're just saying that the language of the Bible, even when referring to, um, you know, God and heaven and Jesus and his return, that it should just be explained according to its obvious meaning 
unless a symbol or figure is employed. Okay, so then just picking back up with that uh, previous slide that we were looking at from AC Bordeaux, he says, well, this is one way to evade the point, you know, hey, we, we can't give these passages in the scriptures a literal meaning. They're just supposed to be understood as figurative, you know, is uh, that's the way it's explained away. He says, and, and this is just evading the point. He says, well, this is one way to evade the point, and we are not disposed to quarrel with any that choose to figure on this wise. And then he adds, who hold to immateriality. In other words, thinking this way, explaining things like this, this is figuring on this wise, you know, to, to think of it like this, that's holding to immateriality. In other words, they believe that these plain passages need to be interpreted spiritualistically, immaterialistically, figuratively, when there's no symbol or um, figure employed, it should be taken with the literal obvious meaning. But if you hold to immateriality, you would explain the, the literal meaning away. And he's saying, um, yeah, he's, he's not agreeing with going about things that way. Then he says something that is just like straight up super clear. We choose all substance and hold to materiality relative to God, Christ, the redeemed, and the everlasting inheritance that the saints will possess to all eternity. In other words, we don't hold to anything immaterialistic. We don't hold to immateriality. Um, it's the same as describing nothing. Remember what he said earlier with Luther Lee's description of the immortal soul and all the terminology being used there. That, that definition as a whole, he says, could anyone do any better in trying to define nothing as to give it this description? He says, we don't want to quarrel with anyone who holds to immateriality but we choose all substance. We hold to materiality to all these things. And that highlights a very, very important historical point regarding early Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, okay? The fundamental truths of our faith are rooted in this belief of materialism. Ism means belief, material meaning you know, the physical or material. And um, this is something that is almost entirely forgotten within the Seventh-day Adventist movement, but all early SDAs were strict materialists. They held to materiality relative to all these things and referred to the belief in the immaterial as spiritualism. So in addition to understanding how this impacts the pillar doctrine of the personality of God, it's just important to be aware of the broader impacts of this um, fundamental truth about reality being material and that immateriality, um, they often said that immateriality was but another name for non-entity. And we're gonna have more content on the channel that goes over that historical information and brings in those documents and and um, just provides the evidence to show that this was a you know widespread you know basic belief underlying all of our fundamental doctrines as um, the movement of Seventh Day Adventism. So, with that said, I just want to thank you for watching through the whole video. Be sure to check out the rest of our person videos. There's a wide range of evidence showing that this was a universally harmoniously taught doctrine established from the very first early days of the movement. And um, that it includes Ellen White's teachings as well. So thank you very much. I hope you're blessed.